if you're a business owner, there's going to come a point where you need a stronger tech stack to have a clear picture of everything all in one place. From startup to enterprise, NetSuite is your one-stop solution. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast too. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers. 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have been upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 25, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you can get a customized solution for all of your KPIs and one efficient system when, with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There was once a time when building a website was a massive undertaking and a huge pain, something that you would need to clear your entire schedule for. Well, guess what? Those days are over, and now you can build a professional, sparkling website in just seconds, thanks to Hostinger. In fact, I recently did this, and I shared the process on my YouTube channel, and it was absolutely mind-blowing, especially considering it took like days on end previously when I first started building websites. This tool is amazing, and I was using AI to do it. So Hostinger is a top highly rated global web hosting and website creation brand, right? And all you have to do to build a website is answer three questions. Here it is. You enter your brand name, you select the website type, you describe your business, and then you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. It's literally that simple. I just went through this process. I promise you, it is the easiest way to build a website. And it also offers some AI-driven SEO-friendly copy, an AI logo maker. Plus, they make all this super affordable. It's less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name. H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. It's incredible. Now back to the show. And so when we when you came on, the first question I said to you, the first thing I brought up was I said I didn't have you on because passive income just felt so phony to me. It felt like I'm going to show you how to make money while you sleep. And in reality, anyone who cares about making money while they sleep doesn't have the heart to do the work while they're awake. And then it was only through time that I got to know what you were about and that. And I had tremendous respect and I felt that I was wrong in doing it. But I wanted to bring up the the passive income name. I wanted to understand that. And so I brought that up. You are listening to Andrew Warner, host of the very popular podcast and show Mixergy, which you can find at Mixergy.com. He's on as a guest today to talk about how he's built his show, how he approaches interviews and how he gets the juiciest of details from his guests in a very comfortable and respectful way. And this is a great show for anybody out there who's interested in podcasts and interviewing and doing uh, or having guests on your show uh, or your blog or your video channel, what have you. You're going to learn some amazing tips, including one of the most mind-blowing tips that I've ever heard in a very long time, which Andrew talks about how he was able to get Seth Godin on his podcast very, very early on. And it's a tactic and tip that we can all use um, not to get Seth Godin on, but to get your sort of top influencer in your, uh, in your space to say yes to coming on your show without being sleazy and by providing a lot of value. And he gives he gives us this the very specific ways to do that that are beyond anything I've heard of before, and it's it's pretty genius. So I hope you stick around and listen for that. Um, what you were just hearing was Andrew talking about the first time that he and I spoke, which was when I was invited on Mixergy as a guest. And it was a very nerve wracking moment for me because Andrew is known as a very hardcore, very genuine, very honest and authentic interviewer. And he's the one that I go to when I want to get the deep golden answers from the people who are on his show. Uh, He just has this way of making that happen. And so uh, we talk more about that situation and, and how that was a pivotal moment in my life. And we talk about a lot more things to help you in your business too. So make sure you stick around, make sure you subscribe to the show if you haven't already. Let's cue the intro. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he studied public speaking by watching over 500 TED Talks and comedy bits, Pat Flynn. 
Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. It's your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. And it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed, according to Indeed data worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. And I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. If you're at a desk a lot like I am, it is really important to move around and increase circulation as much as possible. And a sit slash stand desk can be a massive game changer. If you haven't tried one before, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Uplift Desk is the place to go. There are so many customization options, plus free 30-day returns, free shipping, free accessories with every desk. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? It's no wonder they've been wire cutters pick for six years in a row. Plus, they offer a great range of ergonomic chairs and storage systems if you want to give your whole workspace a makeover. They even have an augmented reality feature so you can see what your new desk will look like in your space using your phone. I mean, they even make a height-adjustable conference table that doubles as a regulation-sized ping-pong table. These folks have really thought of it all. And if you want to build the workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Just go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. Hey, thank you for joining me today in session 334 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. I've been looking forward to this particular show for a very long time because now I get to have Andrew, host of Mixergy.com, on my show, and I'm excited about it too. So I try to ask some really deep questions, and honestly, it's one of the most uh, honest and authentic interviews I've done in a while. You can just tell that um, Andrew really wants to make sure that he tells the full truth behind how he got started and what exactly he did to grow his business and um, really what his inspiration is. So Andrew, if you're listening to this, I appreciate you, brother, and I look forward to hearing the response from the audience. So for those of you listening in, I appreciate you. Now is the time to put that phone in your pocket or turn that volume a little bit higher in your car or perhaps do a couple extra reps for me at the gym. Wherever you're listening, thank you. Enjoy the show. Mr. Andrew Warner, thank you so much for coming on the SPA podcast today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited and a little nervous because I don't know if you know this, but when I was interviewed on your show, Mixergy, uh, it was probably the most nervous I've ever been in my life besides the moment when I asked my wife to marry me. Mm, really? No, I didn't know that. And then I and then I hit you with one of the most challenging questions and most personally potentially hurtful questions I've ever asked anyone. And I hope that I was able to respond in a way that was uh, smart for who I was and my brand. And I loved that you challenged me. And it today is still the f- most favorite interview I've ever done because you ask those kinds of questions. Wow. And so I definitely want to dive into, especially for all the podcasters in the audience right now. And even if you're not a podcaster and you're listening, I want you to pay attention to how Andrew approaches his job and his work and, and, and how he approaches these conversations that he has with people to get the golden information from them for everybody's benefit. And we'll talk about the business that you've created as well. But I'd love to start in the beginning, like before Mixergy, before you started interviewing other entrepreneurs, what were you doing and, and who were you at that time? You know, I'm going to go back a little bit further because I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm a, a little intimidated about being on with you because every detail of everything you touch is so neatly, perfectly organized. Like even the fact that you did this uh, 10 year anniversary show about being let go, the music stopped at the key point where you were going to make a statement and it stopped and there was no music as you talked. And then it picked back up in tempo later when you announced that you were doing this Kickstarter campaign, like all those little details you, you take into account. And I'm not a detail oriented person in my conversations. What I try to do is like tap into my heart. What do I feel in the moment? Tap actually into my fear. What am I afraid of in the moment and let that out. And so 
considering how organized you are, I said, am I even going to be able to survive this? What is this about? It's so weird that my, that my brain goes like that. So here's what I did. I went to my second monitor, my second computer, and I brought up this Evernote uh, folder that I have full of everything that I had on my wall growing up as a kid. I hired somebody to come in and, and take all the all the stuff that was on my wall and all the little keepsakes that I kept and scan them in so that I could always have them. And I'm looking at it to just like reconnect with who I was so that I could be genuine with you. Thank you. And what I see is like old uh, Business Week magazine cover stories, uh, articles about Next, uh, the computer company from back then, TV shows about about successful people like Teddy Roosevelt. That's who I was as a kid. I, I grew up in New York and it's okay to aspire to do something big in New York. And so I aspired. I, there was a part of me also that internally wanted to. And so I'd read about all these people growing up as a kid. And one thing that just happened to flash on my screen right now was a spreadsheet that I created in Microsoft Excel with the little products that my brother and I sold. And you can see for the first few months, it was no revenue, no revenue. And then it picks up. And I had that up on my wall. And that's wow. who I was before I started interviewing this guy who just aspired to do something as big as all these people that I admired. Well, a lot of kids have a lot of ambitions, and many times we talk to kids and they want to be a baseball player, firefighter, an astronaut. Why Why business? I think it's okay to aspire to be that because if you walk into a store, there's a T-shirt that's going to sell you. I just dropped my kid off yesterday at school. I saw so many Batman T-shirts and Superman T-shirts. It's okay to aspire to be that. Our society encourages you to do that. I think there are a lot of people who say – Hey, I saw that 11-year-old selling selling lemonade on the corner. How do I get to do that? I think there are a lot of people who want that. I think there are a lot of people who see these big buildings, who see Elon Musk, who see you driving in a Tesla and say, "How did who made that Tesla? I like that he's driving the Tesla. How did he get to earn that Tesla? And we're, we just don't encourage that. And I felt in, in a very real way at the time that nobody encouraged it, nobody cared about it. That business that you had with your brother, what were you selling? So the first one, the one that I had up here was um, – we just created a bunch of little apps. One was a spell check app before there was universal spell check on a computer. The other one was something called Easy Phone, Easy and then P-O-N-E, that before Skype allowed you to make calls to each other. And as I look at that, I see I'm very proud of the fact that we hit $40,000 in monthly sales there with those little products. And How old that, were you? Uh, this was like 20. Wow. 21, actually. It was right after school. But I also see my my I see everything about who I am in that chart. I see the the excitement over the success. I see the ambition to see those charts go up. But I also see my personal limitation that in that we created Easy Phone. I was very proud that the con the, that and those other products sold forty thousand a month, and I would have been really excited. And I envisioned getting to eighty thousand a month. What I didn't say was. Could this be the next guy or not the next guy? Could this replace the phone company? Could this actually be the next new thing? One of the, one of the things I've learned living in San Francisco is we always make fun of people who live here for every little thing they do is going to change the world. Every little thing they do is not just a little thing. It's something revolutionary. And there's something to be said about that, that I wish that that I had had the eyes at the time to see bigger. And I'm trying to do that. And I think San Francisco is bringing that out of me. It's really interesting. Do you feel that reflects certain questions that you ask people who come on your show, it very much reminds me of the question you had asked me about, hey, Pat, you're doing all these little niche sites and security guard training sites. Like, why not create the next Excel is what you had asked me, which kind of aligns with what you just mentioned there. Is there a reason why you think you didn't think bigger back then and we should all think that big? I think I, I didn't think bigger because I imagine that everything has to just kind of work its way up. I remember saying, I'm going to be the person who by 40 is going to have a million dollars, not by 25. Like this idea that I'm not going to get rich overnight. It's going to happen over time. What I had this vision that eventually I would change the world. And I actually think that one of the things I've learned from San Francisco is forget the eventually. Just say, yes, I'm going to change the world and let the world make fun of you for being one of those guys. And I do wish I had that. I didn't recognize that I asked you that. The truth was that when you and I did the interview, I was just trying to figure out where I was now. And I was trying to understand, is it OK to be someone different than the guy who had all those things up on his wall? Is it OK to – are there other options? What's the menu in the world? What do I want? Now, how did you transition from apps and programs like that to 
what you do now and you have become known as one of the top interviewers and in my eyes the top interviewer i love your i love listening to your show because i always know i'm going to get something different and i always know that i'm going to get the truth um another interesting thing that i am reminded of just now is two of my friends from high school uh, i won't mention their names right now but people could probably go and dig in and find find this interview uh they were they were featured on mixergy for their app company and it was just Sorry, guys, if you're listening to this, but one of the most cringeworthy episodes I've ever listened to because you because. were you were able to dig in and realize that these were just two dudes who were just kind of scrappily putting things together. They didn't even really know exactly how things were going. And I was reading the comments and I was like trying to defend them. And I was like, oh, no, these are my friends. But then I was like, you know what? Like Andrew brought the truth out. And the, th- the truth is these guys, they, they figured out a way to make money and they had really no idea like how it all happened and where they were going to go. Do, do you remember that interview? I think I do. I think I have a sense of who they are and um, they ended up doing okay for themselves if oh, I'm thinking of the same people, right? Yeah, absolutely. They've, they, I mean, they're still doing very well in the app industry, which is very, very competitive now. But what I'm getting at is you have this way of uncovering mm-hmm. in these interviews some of the most important information that we can all learn uh, from. And how did you become such a great interviewer? Like, where does, it, where does that come from? Is that a skill that we can all learn or is that unique to you? Uh, I hired somebody to watch my interviews. I'll tell you, like, I didn't know that I, where this came from. And I actually, for a long time was beating myself up for the the reason that this worked. I didn't, I thought it was a a flaw of mine. I hired someone to list, to go through the transcripts of each week's interview and give me feedback point by point. And I created this like Google doc of all the things that I learned from him. And at one point I just I'm just so tired of it. I'm just so tired. He goes, what are you tired of? I said, I'm so tired of being the vulnerable guy. Every other interviewer is just like, you build up your reputation by being someone bigger. And look at this. In the transcript, I talk about like how I can't figure it out or I don't have the answer. And nobody aspires to put someone like that on their wall the way that I put someone a redstone on my wall. I'm tired of being that guy. And look, in comparison, the person who I'm interviewing gets to be the hero. And I'm the person who's so flawed. Why do I have to be such a flawed wimp all the time in these interviews and he said give me a minute i said i just like poured my heart out you need a minute can you just say something he said, give me a minute and he just kept going through the transcript i was one of the things that i disliked about him was he didn't do his homework he didn't go and read the transcript ahead of time but at least he was a fast reader who can go through every transcript super fast on the call and he said scroll down a little bit So, you know, in Google Docs, if you double click on someone's face, you can go to where their mouse is. So I did that and he goes, you see this? He says, you up there in the transcript, you reveal a vulnerability and the guest responded by being strong. But notice how later on the guest went and got vulnerable. The guest went in and started to talk about themselves and started to say things that they wouldn't say otherwise. He said, if you're expecting that because you're vulnerable, immediately someone's going to tell you the truth of who they are that they don't want to share with anyone – you're wrong. It's not going to happen that way. But if you give it time, you're creating the atmosphere where people can really be themselves and get vulnerable. And so um, the answer is that, that I just really want to get to know the entrepreneur. I really want to get to know beyond the BS. I really do admire the people who I have on. And I think that by being vulnerable, I get to do that. And the start of the podcast was this post that I did and anyone can see it mixergy.com slash I dash failed like I failed where I said I I poured money into this invitation site and it didn't work and I admit failure and I've got to close it down so um, I can just start fresh and I'm just going to interview people to understand how to never fail like this again and that was the mission to see mm. what they're really doing who's your first and, interview do you remember The very first interview was a guy named Michael DeRouche who happened to come to an event that I did. uh, And he was a chiropractor who was just killing it in SEO. In the SEO world, people knew about him back when people didn't even care that that search engine optimization, SEO, was a thing. And I said, if everyone knew who was coming to my events, because I was organizing events using my invitation software, they'd want to come to my events. They'd want to organize events. They'd want to get to know people. So I interviewed him. I liked it. And then I just kept interviewing other people. The one that turned me, though, was... After this collection of software companies, I created an online invitation and email marketing company. We got to over 20 million email addresses. We were doing about 400,000 uh, online invitations a day. Excuse me, greeting cards a day. People would just send greeting cards to each other. 
And one of the people who, who, I don't know how many millions in sales she did for us, but Rosalind Resnick would represent our email list and sell it to companies like IBM. And I always wanted to know how she got where she was. And I got a little bit of a sense of it, but it's kind of weird in conversation at dinner to say, so how'd you get so rich? Um, but in the interview, I got to ask Rosalind about how she started. And I got to ask her about how she built up and how she figured out her business model. And at the end of it, I remember Olivia and I were still dating. And she happened to be in my house at the time. And I said, Olivia, I f- no, I called her because I was so excited. I said, Olivia, I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. I just love that I got to understand all this about a woman who I'd known for years. That's so cool. How do you have the courage to ask certain questions that many other people wouldn't dare ask? I think this is why many people come to you when they want to listen to on other entrepreneurs and their stories because you feel, I don't know if you're comfortable, but it seems like you're comfortable asking those kinds of questions where even with me, I worry about a response a person might have if I were to kind of poke a little bit further than you know I should. I tell the guest my reason and I get buy-in ahead of time. So throughout the interviews, you can see that I say, I want to understand how you failed because sometimes I feel like a failure and I can't snap out of it. I want to understand how how big this business got because I want to know how big a business like that can get. I tell them the reason and I give the answer. We all know about the um, Robert Cialdini uh, book, Influence, where he talks about how someone cut in line in the copier by saying, I need to cut in line because whatever. And if you say the reason, people are more likely to give it to you. The thing that I discovered was I read uh, uh, baby books after we had our first child about four years ago. And in some of them, they say, even if the kid is a year, even if they're a year and a half, just tell them the reason. And I said this to my wife. My wife is very into like, um, she'll read a book and she'll actually implement it. So she went into our kid's room one time when he was sleeping and Shepard was a kid who would scream a lot if he didn't get his way. And she went in and she said, now Shepard, I need you to sleep because you need to have your energy. So tomorrow morning you'll have energy to play with your friend Callan. So go to sleep now and then mommy's going to come and help you in the morning. And to a kid who can't speak, it feels like a silly thing to do, but she was fully bought in and she did it. And sure enough, he went to sleep. And I saw this multiple times. And so when you give someone the reason, they're more likely to, to do that. I love to, that. To go along. You know, and having two kids myself, I've heard that same advice uh, as well. And my wife, April, and I, we implement that too. There's always a reason, right? And my wife and I, come, you know, coming from uh, very traditional uh, Asian parents, um, we were always told no, but not the not the reason behind it just don't do that or that's bad for you or you know there's no reason ever and so we always felt a little resentment as a as a result versus if there's clear logic and reason behind it and i love that so giving the person the guest on the other end a reason for why you are asking those kinds of questions you can't really you can't really kind of counter that if there's an actual reason that makes sense it's really it's really meaningful and it doesn't have to be more than a sentence i used to listen to um uh, Charlie Rose, and he used to be so long-winded that Saturday Night Live had this this sketch a sketch about how he could never get the answer out. Eventually, the guest would say, "Get the question out already." Anyway, he eventually got so good, and I listened to see why he did it because I, I was a bad conversationalist. I could just find myself rambling in conversation. And what I noticed was some of his best questions he'd repeat over and over, and they would be one or three words. Like my favorite one was because. And he would just say because like that. And he would have the discipline to just leave it at that. And so you could just say one sentence like, can you tell me why you close your company down? Because I know at some point I'm going to have to figure out why I should or whether I should close my company down. So now you say something that's really painful for someone and say, this is why I want to understand. And they could buy into it or they could say, look, I can't tell you that, but here's what I can say. All right. So that's one. Here's another one that's a secret that no one's going to know if they just listen to my interviews. Before you came on, I specifically said to you, Pat, there's a reason why I didn't have you on. I could tell you now, I think it's important to bring it on because it helps me understand who you are. Do you mind if I bring it on? Do you trust me enough to bring it on without telling you ahead of time? Or would you rather find out about it? (laughs) And then I I launched into it. uh, And you actually said, I trust you. And I know that that's a big trust, and I know that that's important. Um, 
And so when we, when you came on the first question I said to you, the first thing I brought up was I said, I didn't have you on because passive income just felt so phony to me. It felt like I'm going to show you how to make money while you sleep. And in reality, anyone who cares about making money while they sleep doesn't have the heart to do the work while they're awake. And then it was only through time that I got to know what you were about and that, and I had tremendous respect and I felt that I was wrong in doing it. But I wanted to bring up the the passive income name. I wanted to understand that. And so I brought that up. And it was very, I'm very thankful you did that because it made me realize that that was likely how other people perceived me and the brand as well. So that really brought it to light. And, you know, we've become good friends ever since. And we've uh, hung out at conferences and whatnot together. And you're one of my favorite people. And you, you always bring up this fact that, and this is just random, uh, that I have this like organizer in my backpack and you needed a cord one day. And for whatever reason, that just impressed you that I had this really quick capability to give you the cord you needed because I don't know, I'm just kind of a nerd like that. But um, anyway, I've- let's not let's not brush over that. I was at Podcast Movement, a conference that was really well organized, and I went up to the stage and they didn't have my cable because they didn't have cables. I asked you, do you have the cable that will connect my computer to the the presentation? And not only did you have it where they didn't, but you had an organizer with every potential cable to connect in. So there was no doubt that you'd be that you'd be okay. And you also added one other thing. You said, Andrew, you can keep it. So it was organization that you can see the difference between the two of us. I just walked in expecting that they were going to have it set up. I knew that I could have something delivered the next day for my presentation if I needed to, but that's the way I operate. What I admire about you was you had the organizer and it's not just that I've invited you to dinners at events before you speak. You say, I'm going to go back to my room and I'm going to prepare. It's like the level of detail and care is tremendous. Thank you. I think a lot of that comes because I am a little bit scared and nervous about things. I want to make sure that I set myself up for success and stack as many things in my favor as possible, which is why that organizer is there, right? Like I don't want to give myself a chance to not have something if, you know, I want to have as much control over the situation as possible, basically is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. Going back to the interviewing, I've learned a lot of strategies and tips from you that I've implemented onto this show. And one of those is the idea of A, listening and B, following up, being very, being very genuinely curious about well, the why, just like the example you'd mentioned earlier, and you throw in the why plus the reason, which I think is genius. But a lot of interviewers, especially people who are just starting out, want to go question to question to question to question without the in-between questions. And that's something I learned from you. How do you know what follow-up questions to ask next? Um, I think why and like how come are kind of just universal follow-up questions, but you seem to, in your interview, know exactly what the audience is thinking, and you just seem to ask the same questions that I'm thinking. Here's here's why. Let me show you something. Give me a sec. Okay. Not very far. For those of you listening, Andrew just left the room, and now he's back. <laughs> just went behind the, the computer. Do you know this book? Uh, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Let me show you on my screen here. For those of you listening, uh, I've thrown up the same book. There's the original cover. I think that's the original cover. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really bad at communicating to people because I kept reading about these people who were jerks, right? Guys like Sumner Redstone, Steve Jobs was on my wall growing up. They were just jerks. And so I thought that's the way you have to be. And if you want to be a jerk, it's easy. Understanding how to talk to people and getting them to care is hard. And so I couldn't get a job. Once I did finally get a job, it was an internship because I couldn't tell the person that I needed to get paid and I needed money at that point in my life. And then once I got that job, I couldn't do anything. I was, I remember she invited me, Stephanie Winston invited me to breakfast and I sat there at breakfast and she said, what you need to do now is schmooze the other people at breakfast because we, we have to get them as clients. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how to schmooze them. I'm a fast eater usually. I sat there and I slowly cut my eggs and slowly kept looking down. And and if anyone asked me a question, I answered it very quickly and quietly. And then I went back to looking at my eggs. And the next day, um, I said to her, okay, what do we have next for you? And she said, I think you're actually not the person who I want to waste your time with with breakfast. Instead, can you make me some copies? And I thought, this is a problem, Mm -hmm. right? I can't, I'm never going to get great opportunities. And I watch these idiots who didn't care about work go and get better and better jobs because they knew how to hang hang out. So I got this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It taught me how to have conversations with people. It got me other jobs that were really helpful. 
And then I remember talking to my friend Michael from college and I used everything I learned in this book. It's like, be interested in other people. If you want to be interested, interesting, be interested. So I listened to him and he went on and on about how he had these comic books and how he made breakfast and how he loved making cook, cooking food really well. And I thought this was like a win in the Dale Carnegie world because – Dale Carnegie says, express an interest. And I did. And this person obviously liked me because I let him talk about his breakfast that he loves to cook. and his. But I didn't like me and I didn't like the conversation. I was bored. And I said, you know what? The other thing I need to do is ask myself, what am I genuinely interested in about that person? What What is it that I really care about? And I try to walk into every conversation with that. And so one of the things that I asked you was, I think, um, I don't remember. It was something along, it always will sound artificial unless it's genuinely the thing. But it might have been something like, how does someone who looks so dark have a name like Flynn? Now, that's, that's, art, that's not what I was saying. But it was something about your heritage and about your name that I was genuinely curious about at dinner. And it when I tap into what I'm genuinely curious about, it's hard for me not to have follow-up questions. When I come into you, to you about asking you about your family to understand my family and my kid relationships, it's hard for me not to have a follow-up question. So I try to tap into what am I genuinely interested in? What do I really care about? And my dad being Irish and my mom being Filipina, that's, that's the darkness and the Flynn. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so how much preparation do you do before an interview to unlock that genuine curiosity, um, there's 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 a there's two sides of the coin, right? There's people who will read the books of the authors who are coming on, and they will study them, and they will listen to the other interviews that they've been on, so that they can bring something new to the table. Versus, uh, in my camp, I don't do a ton of research because I don't want to be more advanced than what my audience is when they're sitting and listening to the podcast. So that I can better fill their shoes. Where do you land on that spectrum? I landed in the as much research as I possibly could and as much internal understanding, um, as much introspection as I can. I got so good at doing research and having a good research team that I stopped caring about what I care about. And that made the interviews thorough, but not as meaningful. Mm. So to give you a sense of the kind of research that I do, I used to call up guests like randomly and say, hey, look, you're about to be on. This is going to be – I knew that no one was listening, so I couldn't say it's going to be recorded in front of a big audience. I said, it's going to be online forever. So I want what we leave behind to be meaningful to you, your kids. your Even to this day, Greg Spiridellis, he he says that when I told him that the interview was going to be listened to by his kids and grandkids to understand how he created Jib Jab, this online cartoon company that exploded – he he felt a sense of meaning in the interview. And the reason I said it is because that was my focus, but also I had no audience. I couldn't say, hey, Greg, there's going to be – so anyway, I called up people and say, hey, there's going to be left behind forever. Can we just go over some of the questions that I'm going to ask you? And then what I would do was it gave me an opportunity if the, bo- if the answer was boring to say, hang on, let's cut it right there because – now it's not being saved forever with me interrupting. And so I would do that a lot with people. And then I would I would guide them to stories because stories are what interest people. You're never going to remember um, the, the point that I said about care about what you're interested in in addition to what other people are interested in. Um, but you will remember my story about the guy who told you about eggs and was excited to tell me about his comic book collection. And I wasn't. And through that, the message of – care about yourself too and what you're genuinely interested in will come through. So the way that people remember is through stories. So I kept hunting for stories and I would say, if they would say something like, um, you have to, you have to care about your audience. I'd say, tell me about a time that you cared in a way that would be unusual. And I, and I would just take down these notes and figure out where they're boring and where they're interesting, where they give me real specifics and where they don't. Anyway, eventually, uh, one of my, uh, audience members, um, uh, Owen and yeah, Owen from uh, Sweet Process. He said, you could have someone do this for you. And I said, no, I can't. And he said, yes, you can. I said, no, I can't. And he challenged me and I said, you know what? One of the things that I believe in is starting really badly and improving. So I made a list of 10 questions that I would want to know and I gave it to someone else and I said, can you go and ask my guest this? And they started asking those questions and they were good. And then I'd start to sharpen them and say, guide them towards questions. And here's a way to do that. And uh, excuse me, guide them towards stories. And here's a way to do that. And we ended up with a good pre-interview process. So here's what happened recently, though. 
We had Scott Svensson. Most people listening are not going to know who Scott Svensson is, but he's the guy who created a company called um, Seattle Coffee in in the UK. He built it up. Within three years, he sold it for, I think, over $100 million to Starbucks. Then Starbucks used that as the foundation for Starbucks in Europe. He became so well-known, him and his wife, that they were celebrities in the UK. And then he came to the US where he started Mod Pizza, and Mod Pizza is a f- incredible success story of make your own pizza. Let me see. What is it? Um, I, you know what? I won't have the exact numbers, but he's doing tens of millions of dollars with these businesses, with, with Mod Pizza. The fact that he's a celebrity, though, means that my pre-interviewer asked questions that we could have researched, not in the U.S. Nobody would know him in the U.S., but go into the U.K. papers. So what I said to we need to do was let's find someone to do research for the pre-interviewer so this never happens again. I never mm. want to waste the next guy's time like Scott by asking him questions that were online. And so now we take a list of questions. We give them to Fancy Hands, and for six bucks per, they will fill in our basic questions so the pre-interviewer has the basics and doesn't have to go and ask the same thing over again. And so that's the way that I work. Now, that got so good that I was full of research, full of information, and the problem was – Nobody cares about research, and that's not where you get the heart of the interview. That's not why you care about, like, why you don't you like my interviews. You didn't like my interviews because I researched the name of your high school band, right? <laughs> you liked my interview because I genuinely cared about what I was into, and so I've been reminding myself of that and trying to tap into that in every interview lately. Do you follow the same motive with who you have on the show? Just who is most interesting at the time to you? Who you're most curious about, or do you have another way to? pre-select who is going to be on your show. My problem is I love everyone and I would care about everyone. You came to one of the dinners that I did before. Um, I think it was converted 2016, mm-hmm. the, the conference. You might've looked around the table and seen great people, but there were 18 of them or something because I couldn't say no to people. And so finally there's someone who I work with, Megan. Megan is in charge of helping me organize dinners for events. And what I say to her is Megan, tell me no a lot. I know it's going to be great people. I'm going to want everybody out. Please tell me no so the table doesn't get so crowded that we don't get to know each other. And so one of the things that she's doing is telling me no. Same thing with guests. I have to say to the to the inner to my people, please tell me no because once you get like this the heart of Dale Carnegie of being curious about other people and then you say what do I really care about? How do you not care about everyone? Mm-hmm. It's true. Megan's great by the way. We've been talking to schedule this interview. She's fantastic. Oh, that's right. Yeah. When it comes to um Getting people on your show. Your show is popular enough now where you can just say, hey, I'd love to have you on the show. Most people are going to say yes if they're smart. Uh, and the schedules align, obviously. But for those who are just starting out, brand new podcasters, they worry about people even giving them the light of day for their brand new show that has very little audience size. Um, what tips might you recommend for those who are just starting out in the interviewing scene and in terms of who to select and how to get a person to say yes to come on the show? First of all, I would say that you absolutely should be doing interviews. I think that there's a sense that I shouldn't be doing interviews. Everyone's doing interviews. Tell you what, the the benefits of doing interviews are, first of all, um, you get to learn from someone else while you're while you're doing the work. Second, you don't have to be the expert. Third, you coach ideas out of people that they couldn't come up with on their own because you're genuinely curious about them. And finally, the the, the rubbing off factor. I, I was listening to a conservative talk show host um, do a podcast, and he's a firebrand, firebrand, firebrand. And then he interviewed a, uh, someone who was on the polar opposite of him. And I thought, huh, because he's interviewing someone who's considered uh, a libertarian or not not a libertarian, but someone who's like anti-God. This guy is pro-God because he interviewed someone who was an atheist. I felt like, oh, this guy's sitting down with him. He's not such a crazy conservative. We're fine. I could listen to him more. Anyway, so there's a benefit to that. So having said that, if you're starting out doing interviews, whether it's for podcast or blogging, how do you get anyone to pay attention? That's a problem I had in the beginning. And what I did was I would go to bigger sites and say to them – If I get this person to do an interview with me and pull out the seven points or the seven steps to do whatever, will you let me publish it on your site? And they say, well, we don't know you, but yes, if you could get uh, whoever it is that I was after, they'd say, yeah, absolutely, we'll do it. And so I think that's a really beneficial way of doing things to say to a bigger property, I'm going to do an interview with with this guest for you and then also put the interview on your site. You're not interviewing the owner of that blog or publication you're you're interviewing somebody else and 
capitalizing on that? Yeah, I'll be more concrete. Um, I couldn't get, I didn't think I could get Seth Godin. So I went to Mashable and I said, hey, if I get Seth Godin to talk about all the different ways you can do well, even though the economy is bad, would you, would you be okay with that? And they said, Seth Godin, he can talk about anything. Absolutely. Go for it. Then I went to Seth Godin and I said to him, Seth, can I interview you about the seven ways that people can do well in a bad economy? I'll publish those, that answer on Mashable. And since we're recording it, I'll also publish the recording in my podcast. And he said, yeah, absolutely. And so we recorded it and it gave me some guidance for what to talk about and what to pull out. And then it gave me some guidance for how to turn that into a blog post for Mashable. And then it gave me a recording that I was able to put on, on my site. That's genius. I love that. I think we all know we need to, when we're asking for something, provide value in some way. And I think a lot of beginners don't feel like they have value to give, but I love that sort of marrying of those two, two, two pieces together to create value for both sides. Actually, you become a connector, which is fantastic. Um, what are some of the most memorable interviews that you've had and why? Um, you know what? I'll tell you about one that's going to be published soon. It's um, with a guy named Barry Stamos and... The reason that that one means so much to me is because I was getting back into what I cared about. And so I interviewed him about how he started this company where he had no money, but he said, what I'm going to do is people don't know how to write good email. They don't know how to write persuasive copy, especially bigger companies that have big budgets, but they don't know how to do email well. I'm going to write a few blog posts about how to do email well, and then I'm going to offer my services to any big company uh, to, to create their content. And then he ended up creating content for some of the biggest uh, companies out there and selling it for, I don't know how many millions, but I remember in the interview, I specifically said, did you personally get millions of dollars from the sale of this business? And he said, yes, I did. And there was also an earnout. And the reason that that matters to me is not so much that part, but later what he did was he created a company called One Heart, where it's all about how entrepreneurs should tap into their emotion and tap into their happiness. And the truth is, Pat, I've really been wrestling with this. For, for most of my life, I believed that I shouldn't be happy, that happiness was actually, I shouldn't optimize for happiness. That optimizing for happiness means there are times when I'm so exhausted to go back and work after that is is tough. That's not making me happy in the moment, but I'm optimizing for long term success. Like I think it's in, in the beginning of your podcast where you say something that feels like it's just kind of rift, or your 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 um, the voiceover guy does it. it. Feels like it's just a throwaway line. It's something like work hard now so that later you can sit back and reap the fruits of what you join. It's not sit back and relax, which I, I like. It's reap the fruits. And a lot of the people I admired worked really hard, and then they later on got to reap what they sowed. So I don't want to optimize for happiness. But what I've been noticing, Pat, is that in a lot of my conversations with people on my team, I'm so like so tense, so fiery, so urgh, that how could they enjoy working with me? How could they want to come to work every day feeling inspired if this is who I am all the time on the calls? And so I'm trying to figure out, is this who I still want to be? Is this who I chose to be? Or is this who I happen to be? And so in the conversation, I push back on him a lot on that. And I know, I know that he knew that it was coming from a good place. Said, well, who cares about having a heart? Mm -hmm. I know one of the things that he said was, he said, I said, I'd rather have money than, than like this, this short-term happiness. And he said, well, how good is money? How important is it? And I said to him, Barry... It's really important. He said, no, you, you are happy making money in the moment. And then after that, it's just gone. That feeling is fleeting. I said, no, it's not. I said, Barry, after my kids are asleep, even if they splash water out of the bathtub when I tell them not to, even if they scream forever that they don't want to sleep before they finally go to sleep, even if they throw the food on the floor and I have to pick it up because I couldn't get them to clean it up. After they go to sleep, I look at photos from the day because I still love them. And instead of saying, I, I want to forget I'm a dad for a little bit, mm -hmm. I say, after that, I might look at my portfolio to see how I'm doing with my Merrill Lynch account. And that brings me happiness also to see that my my stocks are up and my my account is big. So I like that I got to talk to him about that. I like that I get to bring this, this genuine feeling up and then hear from him. What's the alternative? I love that. Now, you had mentioned earlier when you were bringing up Barry, you said, you know, you, re you really love this interview because it got you back to what you really cared about. What do you mean by that? 
the research was good. The heart was even stronger. The part where it was, what do I genuinely care about was, I think, stronger than our research. Now, my research was good. He said that he was on this website. I went back and found it. He said his website was doing this. I went back and I looked at it. He Everything that he that I could, I went back and I researched. And there were a bunch of stuff that he said he did that I couldn't find. And I brought it up to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was good. But I got back to asking what do I, what I really care about. I got back to figuring out the meaning of life as an entrepreneur. And it wasn't just through this interview, but that's representative of how I did that. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, we lose the why behind what we do, or we kind of forget why we started in the first place. It sounds like that well, in order to get back to it, it means you had to have lost it at one point. Um, why, why do you think you... Why do you think that was removed at one point? You know what it is, Pat? I'm someone who genuinely wants to make a lot of money, wants to have a lot of impact, wants to have ideas that outlive him. And I work so hard for it, like all the time. And I'm not as successful as Sumner Redstone. Sumner Redstone is a guy who took Viacom from a nothing company and made it, made himself a billionaire and made that into a multi-billion dollar company that eventually owns CBS and others. And yeah, you just happen to see him in the clippings and stuff on my wall. And I say, is it worth it? Like, I sacrificed so much of myself. Is it worth it to have sacrificed it for this? And if I didn't get there at this point in my life, what do I want? Where is the answer for me? Am I still playing? Am I still going through the plays that I wrote when I was a kid with those pictures up on my wall? And is it is it worth it? Or am I just like part of me thinks I'm the guy who lived that cliche about if you reach for the stars, you might fail. If you reach for the what was it? Re- reach for the stars. You can, at, you can at least you might hit the moon or something like that. Yeah. Or reach for the moon. You might hit the stars or something. Uh, yeah. Right. Start reach for the stars. You might hit the moon. I, maybe I, I did that. Um, but is that worth it? Is that really the better way to approach life? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm at a point where I'm going through through and trying to figure that out. And I don't have to figure it out by myself. I can get to ask other people about it and see where they are. And not just in interviews, but because of my interviews, I gotten to know people like Ryan Holiday. I remember I went for a run with him when I was in Austin. And one of the things he said was, people keep telling you to think back to who you were as a kid and what did your kid self want? And he goes, what topic in life would you go to a kid and ask for life advice on? Kids don't know Jack, including you. So why, why would you want to do that? I thought that was pretty interesting, but I do think I knew a lot. I actually think I took a big bet. I didn't lose it all. I did well, but I didn't, I didn't become a billionaire. And there's a part of me that's like dealing with that. Well, you're helping a lot of us and I want to thank you for that. I don't feel that I am. I don't feel like I'm doing enough of it. Like, will people remember me the way they remember Dale Carnegie? No, no. And I, and that bothers me. And I'm, and I'm feeling like I'm going to keep pushing myself to keep trying to, to, to reach that level of, 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 of impact. But Will I get it? I don't know. And will I be okay if I don't get it? Or am I going to feel like it's been a wasted life? And do I want to risk wasting my life? I don't know. That's the question. Like, do you have to be the next Dale Carnegie? Do I have to? You know what the truth is? There's a part of me that still wants to. There's a part of me that even though I, I'm wrestling with this question, in my heart of hearts, I think, no, you, you really are not going, you're, what you're looking for is an, exa- an excuse to get back to who you really are, which is, yes, you do want to be remembered long after you die. Yes, you do want to have more money. No matter how much you have, you want to have more of it. Yes, you do. Um, you do care about those things. Thank you for being open and, and honest about all this. The, the last question I want to ask you, which I've always wanted to ask you, is you know we all listen to you. And if you aren't listening to Andrew, go check out Mixergy, obviously. And we'll have all the links in the show notes and whatnot. But who, who are you listening to? Who are you pulling inspiration from these days? I go through a very eclectic, I try to listen to as many voices as I can, as many different types of podcasts as I can. Um, so I'm, I have no interest in politics, but there was some conservative guy. How do I even find him? I guess I listen. Oh, there he is. His name is, he's very polarizing. So people are going to hate me for even saying it. What is his name? Ben Shapiro. Mm-hmm. Very conservative. But then I also listen to, on the other side, I listen to uh, Pod Save America. Very liberal. I listen to podcasts about um, tech. I listen to podcasts about sports, even though I hate 
sports. Um, Why are you listening? But if you're looking for some recommendations, so what I try to do is just get as many variety, as much variety as possible. We all live in a bubble that we cl- claim Facebook and Google create for us, but the truth is we create our own bubble. We're the ones who are just going through our own life, doing the same thing, listening to the same stories over and over again. Um, so I try to do, I try to vary that. If you want some like business podcast to recommend, I could suggest some for you. One or two would be fantastic. Here's here's actually one that I think no one's going to recognize because I just hit play on it by accident. That's right. Business Wars. Business Wars. Listen to the Netflix story on Business Wars where you find out why Netflix beat Blockbuster. It's interesting and it's a, a story that's well told. And another one is 30 for 30 podcast. They did a really good um, – series of episodes on Bikram yoga. And the reason I like the Bikram yoga one is because it's a guy who came in with an idea and he spread it. And then also he came in with some stories that weren't exactly that were lies and he spread those too. And how does, how, how does the truth, how do lies, how does a mission spread? Amazing. Andrew, I want to talk to you for like five hours and I'm sure we will at one point sometime the next time we meet each other. And I don't know if you're going to be a podcast movement or not, but um, I'm sure we'll, we'll see each other, but for everybody listening, where should they go right now to dig deeper into what you have going on? You know what I'd love to do is I told you that when I talked to the interviewer, every time he taught me something, I'd add it to a Google doc with a list of techniques for getting people to open up, for having yep. good conversations. I'd love to give it to people. If they go to mixergy.com slash Flynn, I will give it to them and they'll get to, they'll get it from my chat bot. Wow. So So, deep inside the research of how you've become a better interviewer right there. It's just a list of techniques that when somebody comes in and is a pre-interviewer for me, I say, I know you think that people won't talk to you because you're not me. It's techniques. It's not me that does it. Here's a list from a Google Doc that I used to keep up when I was doing interviews. So Mixergy.com slash Flynn, and I'll, I'll give it to them there. Thanks, Andrew. Man, we appreciate you so much. Looking forward to sending people your way, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again in person and hanging out again. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thanks for having me on. All right, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Andrew Warner from Mixergy. You can find him at Mixergy.com and all the links and resources mentioned in this episode, you can find at smartpassiveincome.com slash session 334. And make sure to give uh, Andrew a shout out on Twitter as well, at Mixergy, if you have a chance, because I uh, just would love to know what you thought about this episode. And uh, Andrew, thank you again for being vulnerable and honest with us today. Thanks again for listening all the way through. I appreciate you. Make sure you hit subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey there, and thanks for sticking around to the end. If you're looking for more great shows like this one, definitely give How Success Happens a listen, another great show from the Entrepreneur Podcast Network. On How Success Happens, Robert Tuckman features some of today's brightest entrepreneurial minds talking about overcoming challenges and viewing them as learning experiences to create success. The challenges that entrepreneurs face are ultimately what make many of us successful, however we define success, and that's what the show is all about. There's lots of names you'll surely recognize on the show every single week. Just recently, Robert had Nasty Gal CEO Sophia Amoruso on the show and the former CEO of Snapple the week before that, which is really awesome. So listen to How Success Happens right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.